Gear Garage. Go to gear, search Gear Garage for boat repair. There's some stuff there, but there's no classic. NRS has some good videos on how to repair boats yep. too. Yep. All right. Should we bring on Tim? Yeah. Let's talk inter- Aaron, do you want to introduce him first, or if you should bring him on and let him introduce himself? I think he introduced himself. Like we've been All talking right. for a long time. I'm sure other people. So yeah, let's bring him on, and then we can start talking to him a little bit and get because I don't right. know that much about Tim. So. Hey Tim, welcome. To Tim. Hello, hey guys, how's it going? Good, Tim. Good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. So, um, Tim, Tim and I were just having a conversation last week. Like, I found an article. I don't know. Did you write that article, Tim? Or did Martin write the article? There was an article I, I wrote that, you, yeah. You know, about the silicone tent, mm-hmm. tent fabric, and it, it was like nerding out. And so I sent some emails, and you were really nice to answer my emails. And I was like, man, I got like 50 more questions. I was like, well, maybe like we can just talk him into coming on the show and talk yeah. to him about tents a little bit. So it's a little change of pace from what we normally do, but it's kind of neat. So you work for uh, Slingfin, is that right? That's correct. Slingfin. Yeah. And uh, and then and what do you do for them? Um, well, we're, we're a three-person outfit, so okay. we all do a little bit of everything. Um, I do most of the customer-facing stuff, and then as much design as I can do. Um, I do a lot of the materials testing, and. Um, I work in sort of a, a product management role as well. So I, um, I test a lot of the equipment and when we're doing revisions, I'll, I'll take a look and see what needs to be changed to make it a little more usable and make sure, make sure our, our tents are a good fit for the, the market that we're, that we're trying to aim for. Well, so there's three of you, the whole company is three people. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. And then, <coughs> excuse me. And so how long have you been with, have you been with it from some of the beginning? From when the company um, started or? No, not, not since the beginning. They, they were around for a few years before I joined. I, I hopped on about six years ago. Um, I showed up at the studio and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And uh, I demanded a job and I just kept coming back until I was indispensable. That's that's how most people. Zach, you're there. talking. You're talking to Zach. Zach, that's Zach's thing. This, you say, show up and make yourself indispensable, so they need you. Yeah, that's his. Uh, yeah, that's not that's my thing. Issue. That's the thing. Just in life, people. There's books about this. Yeah, it's not just my thing. Tim, I know a little bit about your tents because Aaron sent me a link. I looked at them. They're really cool. They're really expensive. They are. Yeah. So I'm assuming, and I'm. I'm. Hey, Aaron is the cheapest person. I know, <laughs> but Aaron also knows I will spend good money for good gear. Like, Hey, if it's more expensive, I'm like, there's a good reason for that. It's probably right. better. Right. What's better about these tents? You got to hope. Yeah. So pricing for tents, it really boils down to, uh, you're paying for materials and you're paying for labor. So if a tent's more expensive, it's going to reflect an increased cost of one of those two things or both of those two things. Um, so for us, the materials we use are significantly more expensive than what is generally being used in these tent categories. And then, um, and then we also work, we, we work with the contract manufacturer to do our production and they're the best tent factory in the world. They, they've worked with a lot of high end brands um, and they, certainly charge a premium for their for their work especially over the last couple of years but um the the quality of the craftsmanship is in our opinion definitely worth it um especially when we're the ones who have to deal with warranty you know we want <laughs> we want our tents to be as as well made as possible so, so i don't Jim, just to let you know zach actually yeah. manufactured tarps for a while so he's kind of he's kind of <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh, so uh, you gotta be careful yeah. what you say. Hold on, hold on. I yeah. still do. I actually went down to the. I there's sewn here in Hood River. There may. I mean, Hood River's people that sew here are paid really well. Right. And they used to call. I know this because they're made of nylon 420. A pretty okay. oh, that's, that's basic, nice fabric. durable fabric. It's like a good, just it's a combination of waterproofish enough and durable mm. and not super bulky. Right. They used to cost five hundred dollars when I made the last batch. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like eight years ago, they're now eight hundred. Right. It's just the right. I, I'm 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 having ten of them made because right. people want to buy them, but it's right. crazy expensive. 
part because the material has gone up, but also paying somebody a good wage in the U.S. is right. expensive. Very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's 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 hard to find experienced sewers in the U.S. Um, you know, I, I don't know if they're realistically for the scale that we would want to manufacture at. I don't think we would be able to find a production facility that could produce tents at scale in the U.S. at the same quality that that we're producing that because you know our, our designs a lot of our tents are geodesics and they're really the padding patterning is really intricate um so these are these take a really long time to sew um, but we also have noticed a lot of increases in materials costs um and uh yeah i, I think both of those factors have have compounded recently so, so don't you guys make a tent a a, a tarp too or something like that Tim, don't you guys make a big tarp or something like that? I think you guys um, something. We're working on a flat tarp. Um, Martin, our founder, has a has a bunch of, of river tarps um, that he's made kind of on his own. Um, he's a he's a big rafter, um, but uh, yeah, we've got a, a flat tarp that's more more for backpacking uh, purposes because it's much lighter, very compressible. Oh, another thing actually about Is that this one and materials. Um, yeah, so this one is is specifically. A backpacking shelter or you know bike packing um it's a shaped tarp we're also working on it's not on the website yet but we're working on a flat tarp that's essentially just a rectangular tarp that is a little more versatile in terms of the pitch configuration um one one thing to note actually um and this is kind of relevant for a lot of boating applications is that materials cost you're paying the price to weave a fabric is highly dependent on how long it takes to weave the fabric, which is why heavy materials are cheaper. So when you're, a lot of the fabrics that we work with, like this that's fabric here. That's some weird fabric. What's that background noise? Oh, there's, like there's, an airplane. there's an airplane somewhere. Oh, Steve, uh, this is weird. Oh, it's Steve. Yeah. So this is this is the same fabric that we use on the tarp on the screen there. This is a 10 denier silicone coated nylon. Um, and the individual fibers in this fabric are very, very thin. So um, show, show that again. Can you show that again? Oh, yeah. 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 So so this is a really, really lightweight fabric. Um, okay. The denier basically there's a very specific definition for it, but essentially it's it's the thickness, the weight, the weight of the individual fibers used to weave a fabric. Mm -hmm. So when you're weaving a fabric out of fibers that are very light and very thin to make a yard of that fabric, it's going to take twice as long as it does to make a fabric with fibers that are twice as thick. Um, so with boating, weight is not as critical no. of a factor <laughs> as it is with, you know, say ultralight backpacking. So boaters are, are lucky in that they can opt for heavier materials and, you know, paying for a more expensive tent when you're boating isn't always necessarily the best thing to do because you're really, you know, you're paying for an expensive tent. A lot of what you're paying for is a lightweight tent. And if you don't need the lightweight, then you can get something that's going to be just as functional hmm. for a lower price. Now, what about the durability, like on those, like the thinner ones, it seems like it'd be less durable. Is that the case? Generally, yes, but it's not, the weight and durability are not directly correlated. Um, generally speaking, when you pay a lot for premium lightweight fabrics, you know, however you slice it, a super ultralight fabric is not going to be as durable as a really heavy, bulky fabric but you can minimize those diminishing returns by using more premium fabrics. So, you know, our 10 denier fabric is going to have a lower tear strength than a cheap 70 denier fabric, but it's not going to be, you know, if it's three times as light, it's not necessarily going to be three times as weak. But yeah. the thing, you know, heavier, older, like heavy duty, bulky materials, generally speaking, they're going to be more durable. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. These tents are more expensive than tents. I look at the price, I'm like, yeah, that's more than a tent. What I'm hearing from you is, yeah, the material is really awesome material. Mm -hmm. Why is it awesome? Like, what, what makes this material? Why would I want this really expensive material versus something else? So, well, this is a whole can of worms here. Uh, that's what um, I want to know. I'm like, yeah. that's what I'm dying to know. Like, yeah. I, 
I, I, like I said, I can appreciate the fact that they're expensive. I love well manufactured, well thought out design stuff. I'll pay a premium. Why yeah. am I going to pay a premium for this? So, for instance, this this ten denier fabric here. This is like a a miracle fabric. We love this stuff. Um, it's the main thing is that it's a silicone coated fabric. So most tent manufacturers will use uh, fabrics that are coated with polyurethane. Sometimes they'll do a sil silicone polyurethane. So silicone on one side, polyurethane Hold on, on the these other. These are a lot of words I don't understand. Okay. I don't know what oh, urethane yeah, okay. is and polyurethane. Like I think Aaron does because he's, you know, Aaron. I read his yeah. article on it. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited. That, now we're getting into the article more. Now and honestly, like, oh, yeah. I don't really care what it's called. Like, <laughs> right. I, it, why is it better? No, but hold on. Okay, okay, we'll yeah, go into silicone, Aaron's. Silicone, but it says polyurethane. Let's talk a little bit about that. Is silicone less toxic? Silicone is, is less toxic. It doesn't contain fire retardants, which are carcinogenic. Um, the thing about silicone, so silicone is a you know very common material used a lot in, you know, well, it's everywhere. There's, you know, your, your kitchen it's spatula. Silicone, right? your, yeah. yeah, it's very inert, so it's non-reactive. And it also doesn't absorb any water. So it's extremely hydrophobic, and which means it you know, repels water. Um, and because it's inert, that means it doesn't react with other chemicals or water or, you know. But fire you, it does. Yeah, so polyurethane does. So have you had an old, if you've had an old tent, that has been up in the garage for a long time, mm -hmm. 10 years, you take it down, you open it up, kind of smells like puke, yeah. or like, you know, old raisins or, you know, it's, so that's- it's, all, it's kind it's, of sticky, yeah, it's all kind sticky, of- like, yeah, yeah, it loses its yeah. waterproofness. That's because it's a polyurethane <laughs> coated fabric. And polyurethane reacts with moisture in the air over time and it breaks down. It's a process called hydrolysis. So you're gonna get this fabric with the coating starts flaking off mm -hmm. and there's no way to stop that once it's started. Basically, you know, you can try to recoat the fabric with something, but once, once your fabric is, is getting sticky and stinky, then it's, it's time for a new tent. So essentially polyurethane coated fabrics have a shelf life. You know, you can minimize the hydrolysis by, making sure it's really dry, storing it somewhere cool, making sure it's somewhere dark. But ultimately, that tent is going to fall apart. Silicone, because it's so non-reactive, which is why it's used in cooking utensils and all that kind of, and, and you know, biomedical applications, it's not going to have that same reaction. So unless you you know, you, that, that makes you the limiting factor in your tent's lifespan. So if you treat that tent well, it's going to last indefinitely. You don't have this ticking clock of hmm. when this material is going to degrade. But and another, an, another advantage to silicone over polyurethane is that because it's so hydrophobic, polyurethane actually, ironically, most of the formulations of polyurethane do absorb water, even though they're used to waterproof fabrics. So they'll absorb water over time and hang on to that water. They take a really t long time to dry out. And because of that, they're really susceptible to growing mold and mildew because you've got this water in contact with the fabric for a long time. So silicone also, your tents are much less likely. Not that you should store your tent wet ever. Yeah, that's can I? That's now can I? Here. I can just throw it away in the garage wet and it's fine. That's, <laughs> what, that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah, so you're going to have a bigger margin of error there, but I wouldn't. I still wouldn't do it. Um, because obviously not, not all of the fabrics are waterproof. You know, you've got the mesh, you've got mm. uncoated nylons that are breathable for the interior of the tent. Um, so you're going to have a wider margin of error, especially if you're on a trip where it's really wet and you're packing up your tent wet every day. Obviously, it's not feasible to dry it out every time you're packing it up because it's raining sometimes. So you're going to have a much, much larger margin of error for for dealing with moisture. Are you guys the only ones doing this? Sorry. sorry. Um, there are a couple other companies, Hilleberg, for instance, they use two side silicone coated fabrics. Um, a lot of the cottage manufacturers around are using silicone. 
threaded fabrics. I know uh, Mount Laurel Designs is using them on their pyramids and their some of their tarps. Um, and uh, yeah, generally speaking, they're yeah, the, yeah. It's Tim. Not as common. Is silicone more expensive than the polyurethane? Yes, it is. Yeah. Significantly more. 20 okay. to 30 percent okay yeah. whenever i see the silicone coating tents it's always as a ultra light option so i always thought that it was a weight saving thing but it doesn't sound mm -hmm. like it's that's its sole advantage correct are there i have i don't think i've ever seen like one of zach's big tarps heavy material coated with silicone right if a silicone's a better coating, why don't they coat heavier duty fabrics with it? That, and my guess is that cost is a big is a big factor there. Okay. Um, we've experimented a little bit with silicone coated heavier fabrics, and yeah. Um, so we use up to seventy denier silicone coated fabrics, um, and we've had a lot of good luck with those. Um, as to why there aren't heavy readily available heavy silicone coated fabrics out there. I'm really not sure. I think a lot of it's probably a cost saving thing because when you go, when you get into those really heavy fabrics, you're probably using a lot more, um, you're probably using a lot more material and then yeah, yeah. the differences in price become more significant. Can you give us a little primer on Daniel? Oh, they can't make them what? They can't make them more. Oh. That's why they're Oh, Martin, Martin just chimed in and said that also it's hard to make heavy fabrics waterproof with silicone. Why is that? Um, it, it, it's, um, they can't add enough of the material um, when they're coating it. They can't put enough. There's oh, okay. a limit to how much, uh, how much waterproofing you can make with silicone. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. And, uh, we, we, you know, I don't know why. Like, yeah. Person, yeah. Sorry to okay. Start. Yeah. So okay. Do, you guys, do you guys get that? Yeah. 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 Sorry about Tell that. Martin, about <laughs> Martin. Oh, so wait. Tell talking okay. to... Tell me he's talking to three UC Davis. Yeah, we're right three here. UC Davis grads right here. Oh, they're all so. they're all from UC Davis. No, we're yeah. kidding. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Martin. Yeah. Yeah. This, Aaron, Steve, and Zach. Yeah. Hey, class of 1980. Okay. Class, he's class of 1980. You guys are okay. on my headphones, so he, oh. he can't hear you. Oh. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can translate. Yeah. Were, you, yeah. were you there at the same time Martin was there? Were you, did you guys overlap, Steve? I think so, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay, so going back to the silicone stuff. So, yeah. so you were saying you can't you can't make it quite as thick. It sounds like Martin was saying. Um, right. But then, so when like Black Diamond was making that Megamid for what was that all silicone? The, the it, it used to be. It used yeah. to be a, a two side silicone coated thirty okay. denier nylon. Okay. And yeah. then, yeah. What is it now? That's, that's actually how I found your site because I was like, what happened to the silicone one? I want the silicone one, and I started looking around trying to find the silicone because I, I was when I wanted to buy one and I was like, yeah. I don't want this other one. And I was like, and then I found your side, read your article. And I was like, Oh cool. These guys use silicone. But then, then I was like, Hey, are you guys thinking about making a, a mid? Cause I wanted a silicone right. mid because it's, it seems to be uh, optimal for that. Like yeah. what's... I think now it's uh, I forget exactly what they switched to. I, it's a polyester now. Yeah. It's like a 20 or 30 denier. I don't know what the coating is. I, I don't think it's silicone. No, um, no, yeah. I think it's, and they got, they got I, seed, seed, they are, the seams are sealed on it now too with the seam tape. With the tape, yeah. So that's an advantage to then. Then it's not silicone because, yeah. yeah, the main disadvantage, as a, in, in my opinion, as a designer to silicone, is that the tape, the seams cannot be factory taped. So, you know, you get a tent, a lot of tents. You know, you'll see the little strips of transparent tape along all the yeah. seams. Um, that's because the it's a it's a heat activated adhesive and they can apply it at the factory with a machine that looks like a sewing machine. Um, silicone is famously nonstick, so there's there are very few things that can adhere to silicone besides silicone. So the reason that we have these tents set up in our studio here is because we're sealing the seams as opposed to taping. So that's where we mix do up. You hand tape. seal every tent you sell. We we do indeed. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, oh my God. Yeah. Well, all, all of the lightweight ones with the heavy ones, the, the seams do better 
when they're not sealed than the lightweight fabrics. So the, the fabrics that we use above 20 denier, we've done a bunch of testing and they don't need to be sealed. So really? because the silicone is less, absorbs less water than the polyurethane, it tends to wick water through the seams less than polyurethane coatings. Um, so it, it doesn't seem to need any sealing. Because that's one of the annoying things. I feel like the seam tape always one of the first things to go on my that's true. My yeah, product. And that's why I was yeah. like, as I, I saw this, like, I don't want seam tape because the seam tape is going to come off and then, yeah. the seam and then tape you have to seam seal it. First things to go. Yeah, but then I feel like it doesn't the seam sealing, I feel like where the seam tape used to be doesn't seem to work as well. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But maybe yeah. I'm just not good at it. Okay. I have a black uh, diamond tent that I got. This is just a one person, no fly. It's just one layer tent. Mm -hmm. And I got it. I had to seam seal it myself, which was mm -hmm. frustrating because the last yeah. thing I want to do on a Saturday is seam seal a tent. Uh, is that a silicone tent? Is that why? Is because it's a silicone tent, or could it be uh, some other reason? Are you talking about the first light? I think so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that first little single wall. No, that one is some some weird proprietary, not really waterproof, but kind of breathable <laughs> fabric. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. Um, my guess is that it's. The mother fan, yeah. It's the I'm looking at it's the first light. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's actually yeah. been amazingly waterproof for the times. I mean, I'm surprised how waterproof it is for being one layer. Yeah, but uh, seam sealing sucks. It is really not fun to do. Yeah, yeah you know. It's so there's kind of there's three of you that work there. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing like you guys are all like executives. There's like probably you're probably the CEO, the CTO, and this like you're all you're three of you, the tents are made in another country. Right. They get shipped to you guys. And the three right. of you in between being really important, doing important seas level sweet stuff. You're also seam sealing these tents by hand. Yeah. It keeps things interesting. Yeah. So <laughs> like, you're like, Hey yeah. guys, I'm going to take a break from seam sealing tents so I can talk to Aaron. Yeah. That, no wonder that, Rotary is so excited to talk to us. He's like, yeah, Oh, I got really to do this. Yeah. This is important. You want to keep talking? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's, the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's the status on single wall tents these days? Personally, I'm not much of a fan. I mean, they have their place for for their intended use case. And this is gonna sound like a total, you know, industry cop out. Go I think for, for what they're made to do, they work really well. I think generally speaking, people want them to work well for things that they're not designed to do. And that can be a very frustrating experience for a lot of people. So give an example of what they don't do well. Or what they do well, yeah. Or, or what they do well. Yeah. So <clears throat> what what they're designed, I'll start with what they're designed to do. Yeah. They're designed to be used in very cold, very dry conditions. Generally speaking, single wall tents are meant to be lightweight mountaineering tents, like the first light, for instance. Um, that tent is designed to be dug into the side of a snow field on a you know 40 degree slope on the side of a mountain. You get in there, you sleep for four hours, you get up, you break it down, and you go up to the summit. Like that's that's what they're for. When you, when you get into places with a bunch of rainfall, with humidity, that's kind of where they stop sure. working as well. So now I used mine yeah. on a trip that it rained every day and it wasn't yeah. awesome, but it was fine. Right. What I love about single wall tents is they're super easy to set up. As a guide, yeah. I get to camp. I don't have time to like do all the poles and then put the fly over and stick the fly in. Right. I just want a place I can crawl in and fall asleep. I don't right. need like a 15 minute project taking that. This is like, goes up in like two minutes, comes down in a minute. That's yeah, what I love about this, the single wall tent. Yeah. Well, one of the, one of the issues personally that I have with the first light is that it's, it's an internal pole tent. I don't know if you've ever tried to set that thing up in high winds. It is a pain. I've never, um, I've only used it on river trips. So I've never set up in high winds. Yeah. I like that it's internal pole because as I just throw the poles inside, it's super easy. I don't have to do any clips. Right. The like guy can get that, that tent up really fast, but um, I, yeah, it, it I mean, works for me. Yeah. I mean, most most double wall tents too these days are, you know, not 15 minute projects to set up. It's, you know, I can get one of our tents up in two minutes with the fly. It's, you know, they're, they're 
as long as you're working with a relatively simple design, yeah, um, the setup times are really which not of all your that which of your tents is that tent? I'm looking at a website. Which tent is the is, is a simple design to set up? Uh, the hot box, for instance. Um, that's kind of our you closest hot competitor. Box? Hot box, yeah. Um, that's our our closest competitor to the first light. Get your mind um, out of the gutter, Aaron. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what you're. Yeah. Wait, 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 these are silicone, so you shouldn't be doing that inside. That'd be very dangerous, right? And I don't even know what you're talking about. What's that thing on the side? Uh, it seems like a bad name for, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> um, what's, what's that for? That's, that's a, a storage port. So if you, if you go down to the, the photo directly below this, um, yeah, that... Uh, Oh, that, yeah, that's that's the inside view. So this tent is specifically designed as kind of an alpine bivy tent. And one of the criteria we had designing this tent is that there were no points that were necessary to stake out because a lot of mountaineers, they want their tent to have as narrow of a footprint as possible, which means no big vestibules coming off the tent. One of the downsides of most single wall tents is that they have no... Oh that, yeah, yeah. Um, with this one, we 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 you know we didn't want to make a traditional large vestibule because um, that would compromise the the usability of the tent for alpinism. Um, also, a lot of these bivy sites are just you know, small rock ledges where you can't get any stakes in. Um, so we put a couple of snow flaps on the side of the tent that can be toggled into the sides of the tent to store your packs on top of. So those drawstring vents on the sides, you can open those up, you can shove your pack in between the tent body and the fly because it's a double wall tent on top of the snow flaps. And that gives you a spot to get your gear out of the tent while you're still in the tent. Those so flaps you, right there. Exactly. So you can stake them out like they're shown in that photo, or you can attach them directly to the tent body throw your gear on top of them. And then, you know, it's not as good as a normal vestibule, but it gives you some storage space without the need to use any extra stakes or increase the, the pitched area of your tent. Hmm. Okay. I have another quick kind of questions for Steve, Aaron, am I jumping in too much here? Do you guys want to ask questions? Uh, well, you, you want to ask questions about the hot box? Cause I'm going to go someplace else. If I, if I'll I go someplace else too. I'm going to okay. go someplace else. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I want to ask a couple of questions about rewaterproofing tents in that whole yeah. scene, you know, where you put that stuff on to recode them with the waterproofing. Do you, right. do you need to do that to silicone tents then? Do you rewaterproof them? If it doesn't We've never degrade, had to. It doesn't sound like you need to do that whole, that all those shenanigans. Yeah. I've, I've personally never, none, none of our tents have come back. None of our you know, silicone coated fabrics have ever needed to be recoded like um, it's like with my regular tents i've tried to do that put the new coating on and spray it on wet, wet it down and that whole thing okay yeah, yeah. I, yeah. you know i yeah I, that's that's not something we've ever really had to deal with and i hmm. i'm confident it's because of the silicone coatings hmm. okay um yeah i think one thing that we have so many years ago a couple of our tents had some polyurethane coatings on them and we've we've noticed that like some of those floors have needed to be rewaterproofed, and what we've been having people do is just make a, a dilute uh, silicone solution and just paint that on. So the silicone can adhere to the polyurethane um, and can impregnate that fabric and oh, really? can restore a lot of the waterproofness. Um, so my, my, got, ancient, like, my ancient mega mid, I could, I could give it some more, more life by painting it with silicone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're going to save me. See, Zach, it was worth it. You saved me a bunch of money. I don't have to buy it. <laughs> so you're not going to buy one of our tents, huh? <laughs> well, if you, if you make a mega mid, it's a silicone one. I might, I don't know. I'm pretty, like Zach said, I'm pretty cheap. It's pretty, like, pretty, pretty cheap, much, man. Yeah. yeah. I, I bought my mega mid yeah. used off some kid who beating it to yeah you know, if he didn't it, find his tent in a trash can he's probably not gonna he's probably just gonna borrow somebody else's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Borrow, but, oh, borrow yeah. The, 
Uh, he's slept in a lot of art tents, I bet, over his day, over his days. No, 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 no. Never. A silicone never Megamid before. would be if you're looking for another tent to design. That's the way to break into the guide market. We're working on it, actually. I mean, here's Good. here's my. This goes to so, my question. Yeah. Can I ask my question? Because I think we're, we're on there. I feel like when I buy tents, mm -hmm. I bought a lot of tents over the years, personal tents, and also for right. the company I run. Uh, they're all they're always designed for alpinists. Whether we right. buy Mount Hardware, Big Agnes makes some stuff for ultralighters and whatever, but like we're always buying tents designed for alpinists. Right. And nobody's ever said, hey, what do river guides need? Or what are river, not even guides, but like what do people who go rafting need? Like what does that tent look like? And if that yeah. tent existed, a lot of people would be like, yeah, that's exactly what we want. We're just adapting alpine tents to right. the river environment. Right. Well, it's funny you should mention that. We, we do have a tent that we um that we uh yeah oh there you go so, so i just took their website and i'm like what yeah. tent would i what would i want like if i could what could i make work for what i'm doing right. i guess this was the one this would be the one yeah so really yeah so for for river guides or for river trips in general the the special considerations that 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 you guys have are Essentially, one, weight is not as important, so you can use more durable materials. Two, you've got a lot of dust. So, and, and sand. And sand, yeah, and, sand. and yeah, grit yeah. and silt in the river. Um, so you're going to get grit and sand and dust in everything, and that kills zippers. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I'm sure, I mean, one of the reasons mids are probably so popular is that you know, you've got one big zipper. It doesn't go around in the curves. You know, um, that's a less, it's going to fail less quickly. Um, so if you want a tent for rivers, number one, I would say big old zippers. Yeah. Number two, you want a solid canopy because when you get wind that blows all that dust and sand and stuff under the fly, you want it to hit the canopy and, bounce off you don't want it to go through if you've got a mesh tent it's all going to go or if you're using a mid and you don't have any kind of skirt or anything it's going to get over all your stuff it's going to get in your sleeping bag it's going to get all over the place um so this the indus we adapted from one of our other designs and focused it towards the needs of you know river guides and general outfitters and programs so we, we took our crossbow tent, simplified the design a little bit, um, made all the fabrics much heavier, much more durable, which is also why it's less expensive than the crossbow. And we added huge zippers um, and a double door. So to us, our thought is that this meets all the, the main criteria of, of a tent for the river in terms of durability. Double door means a door on each side or one side is just a oh. big door? Oh, so both both doors. Let's see. If you go down to the picture that's two below, yeah, one of those. So there's a mesh, there's a full mesh door there. Uh-huh. Um so you've got a hot, still night on the river. We wanted to give you some ventilation. Um I did the uh, nice. yeah, I, I rode the main salmon last summer. And we had nights in like the 70s, 80s. It was hot. Um, and those all, those nights were also a lot less windy than the, the cooler nights. Um, so we wanted to have the ability to ventilate the tent when it's hot um, while you know keeping the, the ability to completely lock it down when you're getting a sandstorm. So I, yeah. I, I, think, I think about this stuff a lot. I have a lot of complex thoughts here mm -hmm. and, yeah, and so I'm going to share totally. some of them. Yeah. Uh, one of them is like, as a guide, mm -hmm. I think this is a tent I would like, or a private boater. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, this is, this fills all this, just checks off the boxes. Mm -hmm. As long as it, I think it, having a step quickly is important, which it sounds like it does. Mm -hmm. Another thing is like having the floor be really like super bomber material. Yeah. Because we do end up putting rocks in our tents more than we should. It's a thing like right. instead of stick like 
and like for me i don't want to stake it down like mm-hmm. because i don't like i don't know it's just one more thing to do and a lot of times the ground doesn't accept stakes that well so right. i'll just throw a rock in there um and so having the floor be really thick i'm not sure how thick the floor is but like that's a, that's a big deal yeah. this would be like a high-end awesome tent for probably one person it says it's in just two but is it really gonna, is it does it barely fit two people by backpacking standards this is generous for a two-person tent okay yeah okay i mean you're so, not going to be able to spread out with two people but you're not going to be spooning all night okay so two so it's so it's a one person tent that could it's, handle it's, two people pretty comfortably do you have you ever used a what am i going for? like a uh, what are those big pads that everyone likes to use Paco you, pads. You, you, what like the Paco pads could you fit two Paco pads inside that next to each other it depends on the, the they, they make Paco pads in different widths um yeah. so this but this like, is a 50 this is a 50 inch wide tent so you can fit two 25 the, the standard for an extra wide sleeping pad is 25 inches so you could fit two of those okay. next to each other okay. but aaron the smart people put their pocket pads under their tent underneath i know i agree i agree I do, yeah. but that's more was trying to get width on it and i agree you, you don't do that steve yeah. I don't have no, a pocket pad. pads. We could do a whole show on pocket pads, and I would dominate. <laughs> no, Zach, Zach, you, Zach agrees with you on all of it. I, I don't, think we're all pocket pocket pad haters here, pretty much. I'm not a pocket really? pad hater. I'm not a pocket pad hater. I'm not a lover either. I'm in between. But if if there is an extra pocket pad available, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll grab it and throw up my tent on top of it. Yeah, yeah. Because it's durable. Yeah. It's easy. It's it's less well, work. You're just <laughs> to protect your thermorest. Yeah. <laughs> no, they protect the floor. Protect the, the, the tent. Like it's actually yeah. to protect the floor. I I have a lot of holes, Tim. I have a lot of holes in the floor of my tents. So yeah, I don't yeah. know. So I think as a guide or like a private boater, this is a cool high um high end tent. I think mm-hmm. for commercial guests, I would I could never buy this for commercial guests. It's Why so expensive. Well, oh. it's expensive, and I I want to have even an even bigger tent. Like like I'd want to have a bigger tent and i wouldn't want there to be uh i would want to stake in the vestibule the tents right. that we use the that just goes out and the vestibule there's no vestibule that goes down okay because like the staking if i if our guests are setting up the tent they're going to struggle with the vestibule i've watched a million guests try to right. stake a vestibule and they can't figure it out and it's a mess and it flaps in the wind mm-hmm. and if guides are setting them up you know to set the tent and do a bazillion stakes it's just not going right. to work I yeah. like this. That's funny. I prefer the tents with the vestibules on them. Well, on so them. As, a guy. as a guide? Yeah. Oh, for yeah. the guests. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the ones we had at Arda, the, what was that? The, um, what was that company? Sierra Designs ones? No, no. Um, who, Steve, who was the company that was making those tents? Um, Alps the, Mountaineering the, ones? The Alps Mountaineering the ones. The Taurus? Yeah. Yeah, just like See, it just, and I like full how they, vestibule. I like those. The full vestibule on both sides. People can put their stuff underneath there. They have space inside for themselves. Otherwise, if it rains, the stake comes undone, and there's just like they're sloppy on the outside. Half yeah, the guests yeah. don't even set them up. Uh, maybe, but usually, if you, I just go around and make sure everyone was set up fine. And then yeah, of course you did. Of course, I'm sure that's what you uh, did. It's, it's good guiding. Walked yeah, around. Maybe, maybe a better guy, Zach. You wouldn't have sure to let our tent expert weigh in yeah. a little bit here, Tim. Tim, you've been really diplomatic. It's been really yeah. fun to listen to you. I have just go ahead and bash whatever that polyethylene polypropylene whatever what was it urethane oh polyurethane is there any reason that i should ever buy a polyurethane tent again uh silicone seems like it's just way better i can't i can't think of a of a good reason i mean if you know if you if if you know 20 minutes of seam sealing is enough of a disincentive to sacrifice a, a lifetime of a more functional product, then, you know, that's a, that's a trade-off that I, I can't choose for you. But uh, generally speaking, I seems like silicone's use. a way better material to use. And if you could just say, I'm never going to have to smell that smell again, oh God, that's yeah. enough. Never again. That. Yeah. That's a, you, you pull your tent, you haven't used it for a couple of years, like, oh, I got to get out the big tent or whatever. And then you take it, you're like, Man, oh, it peels God. apart. Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all. And you try yeah. to sleep in it, and you're like, no, this, yeah. It, no. Yeah. yeah. So one, one off-label way to get around that. The, so I, this is, you know, this is certainly going to avoid your warranty. Um, <laughs> but you know, if it's the difference between not using that PU coated tent ever again, and you know, getting a couple more years out of out of it. Yeah. Um, if you throw that in the washing machine. Which you should never do with 
a good tent that still works. But okay. if this thing is falling apart, put that in the washing machine, wash it really good, get all of that coating off, get all of that flaky coating off. You know, put I'd say put it in the heavy cycle. Okay. Then get it down to the uncoated fabric. Then you might be able to paint in that that silicone. How would I buy that silicone? So what we yeah. use for silicone for seam sealing, um, it's just household silicone caulk from GE. It's 100% clear silicone okay. caulk. Hardware store. Yeah. Um, and it's got to be the clear stuff. I guess okay. you can use colored if you want. But And then we mix it in with odorless mineral spirits, um, which it's it's actually suspension. So you just have to really stir the crap out of it. And then you get it homogenized. And that's what we paint on the seams. And then the mineral spirits evaporates and it just leaves the silicone. So we use a thicker combination of that for seam sealing. But if you were gonna waterproof a, a fly sheet with it, I would dilute it a little bit more. So you have like a kind of a, like a heavy, little bit less viscous than heavy cream, like maybe whole milk consistency. And, okay. you know, you could probably, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it'd be great in any kind of know sustained downpour it might it might but it'll definitely be more pleasant to occupy than a than a hydrolyzing stinky pu coated fly sheet okay are the mineral spirits like those bad to breathe in um not really i we've we we use i mean we ventilate it it's you know not going to be it's not as bad as toluene it's not as bad as you know any of those other yeah. chemicals and um, it's a pretty common household solvent. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do, you do, mask up? do you all your mask windows up when you, Do you mask up when you use the mineral spirits? No, we just open the door and turn the fan on. Huh. Yeah, I've done enough to all you. Don't want any more. Um, yeah. All right. I got a couple of questions. Tim, where are you right now? Uh, I'm in our studio in Berkeley. Berkeley? Yeah. Right on. And the name Sling Fin. Story yeah. there? Martin's Martin tells it better than I do, but uh, Martin, do you want to tell the story? Oh, is he? Is Martin out? Martin's not here. Um, basically, he wanted. It was a, it was a combination of. Oh yeah, do you want to tell the story of the name Slingfin? Googling tents right now. Tents are expensive. Hi. All right. We, we were asked that so often at trade shows for a while, we said it was a medieval weapon. <laughs> but it, uh, the, re the reality was um, um, I was domain mining a while back and I was looking at climbing slings and uh, fins. And um, I ended up putting the two together f uh, because it was something we, you know, like a climbing sling, sling and a fin of a, a fish. So we could do things in the mountains and we can also do things in water. So the idea was to have a name that covered sort of, sort of everything on Earth uh, that let us, you know, not just be, um, um, you know, dedicated to things on land, you know, because I, I like boating a lot. I like water a lot. And so that's that's where the name it was really. And I, I bought it like, I think, two or three years ago before we used it. The original name of the company was Expedition Technology until we got um, the trademarks for Slingfin and then we switched it over. Cool. But I think Expedition Technology still is up with the logo. What well, in the in the sling fin sphere in your world? What's the furthest thing from tents that you're working on? Like, what are you dreaming uh, up? Uh, what's? I didn't hear the beginning of the question. Sorry. In the sling fin world, is there anything way outside of tents, like some Martin's Midas invention that you're? I mean, that's sort of your reputation from UC Davis days was you were a, a trendsetter out in front. Huh. What's the, yeah. what do you work? Can you tell us or is it secret? No, 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 no. Um, you know, we have some new, you know, like usual, it, we have new materials. I mean, what made Patagonia was fleece, right? You know, they found okay. a bankrupt, uh, 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 a wool, uh, you know, a company that made uh, like uh, a wool and, um, and turn it around. So, you know, we're we're uh, looking at, uh, as always with some new materials and working with new materials. And we found some really interesting materials. Um, so we work with the suppliers there. So that's one thing is just materials. Um, I'm working on a different way to pitch tents. 
So we are, you know, we're working on things like that as far as outside of the brand, um, you know, or outside of what we're currently doing, you know, you're better off doing what you know, you know what to do well. <laughs> and, and once we get large enough and stable enough, then we can branch out. We, we have some, I think, um, some worthy um, ideas for making other things that are, that are currently made in the industry that uh, we don't think that people could be doing a better job. And I think some of these companies, um, you know, they, they just, you know, you have the left brain leaders uh, uh, trying to manage the right brain, creative parts, and, and um, I, you know, the bean counters sort of, I think, uh, sort of squash the the good ideas and, and they don't let people um, uh, play, you know, throw enough spaghetti on the wall to come up with creative things. I mean, there are exceptions. I mean, ARC does a good job. Patagonia does a good job. There are companies out there doing a good job, but in general, I mean, there are a lot of things that can be done better. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so as far as far, far right ideas, yeah, we, you know, it, those ideas, you know, you work on them for years and then, you know, something new comes up. I mean, I locked myself in the, in the office for six months and then came up with a web trust. And that's how that started is, is just trying to figure out a different way to pitch tent. So, I've got another. Uh, I've got another idea that I think is more of a mainstream idea. The web trust is pretty pretty specific. In in general, it's it's, it's fairly. Um, you know, not everybody needs a web trust, but um, this the, this new way of pitching the tenth, I think, is going to be a lot more interesting for a larger group of people, and I think it'll solve some problems. So, you know, we're trying to solve problems that other people haven't. We've found some good fabrics that, for some reason, the big companies just. I don't know, they're sitting on their thumbs, you know, uh, uh, doing sales projections instead of figuring out how to improve things, how to make things easier and nicer for the consumer and um, and cheaper. So while our tents are, are might be more expensive up front, I think they're actually a better value in the More, sense yeah. that they, they tend to last longer. And our, our big thing is to, to make th uh, make products that work for their intended use instead of just marketing towards the intended use that we actually that actually works and that worked for us at mountain hardware and and, and it's working for us here so um and as long as we don't have to work for an absentee owner i think we get to use those materials that allow us to accomplish those tasks cool is cool. there is there some material out there where like if price was no object if a tent could cost four thousand dollars that you could use right now you're like oh let's throw that that material in it well I, i'm gonna go back in the 20s they made tents out of uh, uh for mountaineering out of silk and bamboo okay and when you think about it, those are two pretty amazing materials so you, you could actually go back to the uh, to the origins of the whole thing and say you know people did a pretty good job way 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 back in the day Whoa. um <clears throat> but money is no objects no because um, a lot of those materials are films and I think films are somewhat limiting. Um, I mean, you know, the, uh, what, what are, are we call it the Cuban fiber? Yeah, you know, that, dynamic that, composite fabric. Dynamic yeah, is a very the composites. I think very trendy material right they're, now. They're, they're, I think there are better ways to go than that. Um, but again, um, it turns out the bias stretch on fabrics allow you to um, um, get the tension around um, like hyperbolic paraboloids or whatever down, down these different shapes. And while some of these uh, uh, thin films, uh, it's difficult to do that. So it's one of those things where you just have to have the right material for the right job to accomplish the right task. And, you know, we look at these things as tools, you know, what, what's the right tool to get the job done? So to answer your question, I mean, people are already using the $45 yard fabric and, um, you know, there, there, there's some issues with that because they still have to coat it uh, so that they can weld it together. And that's a whole separate shit show unto itself. And plus the, the cycle times in, in Asia, they don't like those long cycle times for, you know, welding things together. So they want to take shortcuts. And, you know, it's just every new technology has its own, um, you know, challenges to in production um, uh, things to figure out. So, um, uh, you know, and. We're, we, we're, we've been at this long enough and we have enough relationships where, you know, people are, are starting to show us materials. And, you know, we, 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 we kind of um, have gotten to the point where we get to play with those things. When you first start out, it's hard to have access to those materials. Um, so, I mean, I, I've got a pure, 
mean, from long ago, I've got a, a, a Kevlar material that was actually a parachute. No, excuse me. It was a bomb parachute material. And that was like 50 bucks a year, a, a yard 50, uh, 20 years ago. Um, it's an incredible fabric, but, you know, it's not going to solve our problems. And, and the money is not the issue. That So and, and it, it, I think the trick is everybody wants to go lighter, lighter, lighter. And, you know, when do you go do go too close to the sun? And so those super <laughs> high, highly constructed, lightweight fabrics, especially in the nylon 6.6s, they're expensive. And they, they're really slow on the machinery to make those high thread counts. And so, you know, while that material is not a, a $45 yard or $40 yard fabric, it's an extremely technical um, uh, fabric. And it, and it just seems to work better than most, almost anything we found. And we sort of requested that fabric a while ago. And one day they made it for us and it turned out to work. And it turns out that for us, that's a magic fabric that, um, you know, it has more UV resistance and lasts longer than other fabrics that allows us to make tents that are light and strong. So I think that's the name of the game. So, you know, I've, I've worked with titanium tent poles. They're useless uh, in the current, um, you know, configuration. Uh, we were, I was using a, a hydraulic lines for the Osprey. They're making titanium tubing uh, and the stuff that didn't pass tests. They'd send to me and we'd play with it. Uh, we made we um, a buddy of mine made some uh, titanium ice axes. Uh, when I was at Mountain Hardware, we even um, flew to uh, Ketrinburg to look, go to the world's largest titanium factory to uh, uh, play around with uh, titanium. So um, it turns out that it's a great material for some things, but not for other things. And uh, it turns out for tent poles, it's it's very flexible, and it's too flexible, and that you don't really want that in general. Hmm. So you want to show me something? Yeah. Hey, I need to make this pole, but that I contacted a company that makes tent poles, and they won't bend a pole this much. Well, it, well the reason it partially is, um, you you, you need a, a a roller die machine to do that, or you need a a, a CNC machine um, that'll uh, 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 do that, like. Um, um, what, what's it called? Super trap or whatever. They used to be in Sacramento. They had the right machines for that, where you have an internal and external die. Part of the problem is that looks like a 7001 tube. Um, it looks like it comes from Yunnan, maybe. And um, um, what, what they do is they bend it and then they anneal it. <laughs> you're laughing. You, I, it's you amazing. You just look at you like, know that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just like, like, like oh, that's sure I could. And, to me, it's a good. yellow, it's a yellow tube. That's all I know. <laughs> no, no. To, I to, work to, on my pole identification. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, uh, why do you need that? There's a very specific tent that Dana Designs made. It's a t tent that covers a toilet that Dana Designs made 20 years ago. And it's the best tent ever to cover a toilet on a river trip. And we broke, see, this end's broken. And so I need to replace this on one of our toilet tents that we absolutely no, love. No, no, no. Just, just cut it off where your hand is uh -huh. and just add another piece there and, and glue it with some um, anaerobic, I think it's called anaerobic glue from, uh, um, from Loctite. All right. That's smart. And then the problem solved. You've got your uh, – you, you've got your – Just put a sleeve in there when you cut off both ends. Yeah. Okay. Martin, That's a Martin, smart Martin. solution. Martin, when you were at, when you were you were you were worked with Outdoor Adventures at Davis, did you do the repair yeah. stuff in the back? Were you the repair guy in the back for a while? Um, never, never. Oh. No, 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 no. Um, I was a whitewater coordinator for a couple of seasons. Okay. And um, actually, I helped uh, Dennis Johnson get his job. Oh, did they, you? They wanted, yeah. Actually, I got him the job. Really, ultimately, what yes. happened is they wanted to hire. We we had some issues with the MU regarding um, paperwork. Uh, Outdoor Adventures wasn't that yeah. great for uh, following the rules, so to speak. <laughs> and so they wanted to bring. So so they brought all the managers together. They we we listened to all the the prospective uh, uh, um, candidates, and um, the, everybody picked this real officious um, paper pusher. And I, and I. And so five of the managers voted for the, for the, this other guy. And I'm like, you guys just ruined the program. And they're like, what do you mean? I go, Outdoor Adventures is about teaching uh, students how to be leaders and, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, getting them out in the field and allowing them to, to grow and, and bring other people in the outdoors. 
paper pushing doesn't get you in the outdoors. You know, it makes the MU happy. And the, uh, the big boss agreed with me and they hired Dennis, but they, they were ready. I mean, it was a done deal. This other guy was getting hired and I'm like, stop, <laughs> you know, you got to hire Dennis. He's the right guy for this job, you know, cause he can teach the students how to uh, train other students so that the program thrives and moves on. So, I mean, who knows where it is now? Oh, and I got a really good permit for the South Fork. They have all those user days because we wow. learned that about was the, you. Yeah. I, well, I, it was me and Dave Rapley. What, you know, he filled out the forms and, and I said, stop. I go, that's not how it works. What they're doing is they're this year. They want you to they, they want to give you the next year user days based on this year's use. Uh, we've been on the river longer than almost anybody on there. You know, most of the companies, there are very few companies that were there before Outdoor Ventures was. And um and I, I go, you you take every weekend and fill it to the max and, and send that in. So, you know, we embellished it a little bit, but all the companies did that. And I think we ended up with the third most weekend user days. <laughs> and so anyway, so, you know, it's just um, you have to know why people want, want to, you know, you have to know the reason why behind things. And it's the same with design or anything. You know, it's like, well, why do you guys want to know this information? Well, I know they're they're handing out user days next year. Anyway. Um, so, wow. uh, so hopefully OA in, in the, the outdoor, the, the whitewater program allowed, um, the program to make enough money to do other things. So it sort of was the cash cow that supported everything. No, we, yeah, I don't know if you know that all three of us were part of it. So, oh, okay. what did you guys do? Well, I was the water coordinator at one point and, uh, it's, it's before or after you. Larky. Oh, way, uh, way after Larky, like after uh, Laurel. Yeah, like I, in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. I guided and repaired boats for Greg Widrow. Oh, okay. So there he was. I, I got the job after Greg. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah Greg, and he's the one that turned Outdoor Adventures Whitewater Program into a business. Yep. You know, he, he got yeah. it going. And you kept it going and a lot of people kept it going. And it, it was we all benefited from it. That's good yeah, to hear. You look at the you look at the alumni from that program, and it's pretty impressive. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people went on to do amazing things. I mean, look at Julie Munger. Yeah, you know, with her rescue stuff, and um, yeah, uh, uh, and that's what the program was designed for. And I hope it's still doing that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Is. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't go on the South Fork very often, so I, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> You'd not not there's anything wrong with the uh, South Fork, but I really enjoy the Tuolumne. So, have you guys been to the a launch site on the Tuolumne since they built a new ramp? Yeah, it's pretty nice. <laughs> it's incredible. Steve, Steve, Steve had a lot. Steve, didn't you have a lot to do? Didn't you come my, in? My initials are on that ramp. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, I gave those guys, I gave Marty some, or uh, the, uh, whatever, the Tuolumne River Trust some money for to help. Because Marty paid for a lot of that, so yep. uh, to you know, I kicked in some money for that too. Yeah, it's quite an improvement. Yeah, so um, especially when you can compare it to the old put in, like you know how uh, much the better old put it in is. really was was uh, not much uh, besides a little poison oak and a, a couple of rock steps here and there. Yeah, but yeah, that new one sore backs from that old put in, and uh, the commercials like it so much they tend to use it too, right? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, <laughs> it changed the whole thing. Yeah. So well, hopefully they can figure the takeout because that's a pain in the ass. Yep. So we 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 used to get the uh, uh, Marty's outfit to, every once in a while. We bribe those guys with some nice tall Guinness beers and they <laughs> bring our boats up. But uh, that hasn't happened in a while. Yeah. So um, anyway, um, well, is, and you, so you guys are all involved still in uh, a way somehow. Oh or no. Just, no, 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 oh, no, okay. no. No, I mean. So Steve ran Arda for how long did you run Arda for, Steve? Thirty-five years. Yeah, so, so he was running Arda for like forever, and then Zach's got a rafting company up Northwest Rafting, and I just a bum. I'm still a bum, just kind of bumming <laughs> around, like like working for these guys when I can. So oh, awesome. and if you, the three of us, probably know each other peripherally through UC Davis, but primarily through Merrill's pool me. put in. Yeah, we yeah. probably spent more time together there than anywhere else <laughs> on the face of okay. <laughs> We're all very connected to the Tuolumne, and that's how we, we yeah. spent the most time together, for sure. Okay. So um, I know uh, one of the ARDA board members. Um, oh, my God. I can't remember his name right now. Um, he lives in Auburn. Glenn Carnahan. Glenn Carnahan, yeah. 
So yeah, he's uh, another UC Davis. White yeah, white another UC guy. Davis alum. Yeah, yeah. He, he's a class act. Uh, yeah. I really enjoy. I, I run some uh, uh, business things past him every once in a while, and um, and he's kind of uh, um, you know sort of been an unofficial advisor for 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 a while. Yeah, he's a good, smart guy. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, it annoys me when he says that he runs uh, Lumsden Falls without incident. And the, the, I mean, that, that does, that's not the part uh, that annoys me, but that he can do it so easily while I look at it and go, I don't want to do that. So <laughs> I, I'm just really, my hat's off to the guy. Yeah. Into the, into the newer generation that can do those things. Yep. So, um, well, thanks for making such good tents. Oh, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> thanks guys for letting for... Tim educate us. It's been really <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah. That would have yeah. taken me three times as long to explain all that because you know, <laughs> through all the crap and those straight... digressions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Make, make his point. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so our, our factory calls them uh, the secret weapon. <laughs> so anyway, well, um, uh, thanks you guys. And yeah, thank Martin, you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So now we know how Slingfin got its name. Yep. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for letting yeah. them do that. Hey, yeah. So I have one last question for you, Tim. We we're talking yeah. briefly. Why doesn't anyone make a mid with just some? What would be the disadvantage of making a mid with a, just a layer of uh, what is that called? Like a like um, mesh around, mes the mes bottom. around the bottom. Yeah. Why doesn't anyone ever? done anything like what what's the what if i want to do what why do you think people don't do that what's the problem with that you know i'm gonna, I'm gonna oh go mark's got some thoughts one. about this one um, <laughs> we, we, we chat about this the other we day made a, 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 a structure called the bat wing at mountain hardware a while back yeah um it won some award for you know some ridiculous design i wanted to start. we ran the mesh around the, the perimeter and it, it turns out that's a great idea in concept but it just didn't seem to, uh, you know, it never caught on. So I don't know if it didn't caught on because other companies didn't copy the idea and then include it, and then it became sort of an industry standard, or it was just an outlier. So Tim keeps on threatening to make uh, a um, a split wing. That's and, our uh, that's our shaped tarp shelter that you were looking at earlier. Uh, with, with that and to try it out, but um, uh, it just, you know, at putting mesh right on the ground. You know it's, where it's yeah. going to get the most abrasion is, is a tough one because it's not it's not going to last terribly long. Um, so, but I think it's a decent idea. Um, I don't know that the weight is worth it, but um, mm. um, it's it, you know it's been tried before, and you know maybe it wasn't maybe it wasn't executed uh, well enough, or it wasn't thought through enough, or. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think it could be one of those things where it's worth another try. I think we'll eventually make one uh, prototype to try it out, but, and then check out the weight. And, uh, but um, I mean, it completely makes sense. Okay. In, in I, had a, I had a friend who did that when I worked for Our Bound because we weren't allowed to have tents. And so he put mesh around the bottom of his mega mid. So it was a, it was a tarp and then we'd hang outside and all the kids were getting just chewed on by mosquitoes that we'd be hanging out in his mega mid with the, <laughs> with the little mesh along the bottom. It just seemed like a great idea. Cause I love the floorless tent kind of mm -hmm. like you just throw it over your stuff and put it up and it makes life really easy. And I was like, I don't know why anyone, no one's ever done that on a commercial scale. Like, like my friend, he had his mom do it or something like that. Yeah. So I've I always just been scratching my head thinking, oh, that seems like a good idea. So, yeah. So I did actually sew a mesh skirt on one of our tarps and I, I tried that out on the uh, Sierra high route a couple summers ago and it actually worked really well. Um, my, my gut feeling for why bigger companies aren't doing it at scale is because it would be a pretty niche market. You know, I think, I think the main, like the largest market for mids is you probably like ski mountaineers, you know, ultralight winter travel is kind of the main, I think that's, that market is probably larger than, you know, river guides, you know, using mids on the beach. Um, and for that, you know, you don't want the mesh cause it interferes with airflow and it's going to increase condensation. Um, so I, I, I do think that there, I, I think that there are some good use cases. I think it wouldn't work as well 
outside of say you know like the southwest because the humidity in the air there is really low and like all single wall tents kind of the achilles heel is condensation so mesh you'd you'd be surprised how much airflow is blocked by mesh yeah. um you know you think it could go right through but it's really it's not at all um it's you know more it allows more air through than solid ripstop nylon but um, in terms of condensation management, if you've got mesh blocking your airflow, it's actually going to significantly increase condensation. And, you know, when you're somewhere like, you know, in the Southwest where, you know, the humidity is 30% or something, you're not really going to have many issues with condensation. Um, so adding the mesh wouldn't necessarily cut down on it, but it does just mean that the, the, the realistic usable window for those shelters for that kind of shelter would be a little bit smaller. Um, so that's why I think none of the, the none of the big companies have uh, have gone for it. And I think when it comes to the ultralight backpacking market or you know bike packing, a lot of those people want a little more modularity. So they want to be able to use just the because weight is so critical. They want it when they don't have any bugs. They don't want to be carrying any extraneous weight. So they don't want the weight of that mesh. Um, so yeah, I mean I think. Yeah, my, my gut is that it's just a, it's just a market size thing. The, the ultralight crowd, it's really funny when I ask them about bugs, you know what their answer is? Walk faster. <laughs> Seriously, what they say. Oh, and Zach, um, so get a hold of Tom Hagerly at Tentpole Technologies and okay. get your dial caliper, calipers out, give them the ID and OD of the pole, tell them what te tent it came from. And, and if he can't replace that piece, he might have a straight piece. Um, that you can buy from him, and then you just m make the rest of that. Tent. I'm right. just gonna. I'm gonna contact Tentpole Technologies. Yes, mm -hmm. and the okay. guy's name is the owners. His name is uh, Tom Hagerly, but and and yeah, just tell him what what tent it is, and give him the inside ID and OD. He probably just needs the OD, but it's usually better to give him the ID and OD. And then, um, uh, and he should have something there that uh, that should. You know, if he doesn't have that curved piece, he should have the straight piece. Awesome. I mean, this this tent is the ultimate groover covering tent. I, so, I'm all I'm all about groovers. So um, so I, I think this is important. I actually want to. The part of the reason I want to I need to fix this one. That's on my list to do. Yeah. But also, like I've been thinking about making more to sell because okay. I know how much outfitters need. Like we buy these these tents that cover groovers and they break really fast and they're difficult to set up. This one is amazing. This design is amazing. And so well, I mean, it looks like they're using the right pole diameter. I think most of them use, yeah. they're really flexible and yeah. it's a structure that's tall and narrow, you know, at the base. And so there's not much, you have to guy out, guy the shit yeah. out of it. And even then it's just a bad wind profile. So yeah, this one was done right. I mean, you know, Dana designs, they did amazing because they still, I mean, they do amazing work. And it's an amazing, and they weren't really in the tents. They were in the backpacks. No, they bought Garuda, right? I think they bought Garuda. Oh, yeah. And Something then like they that. assimilated Garuda. And um, I don't remember, I can't remember the owner's name. So I don't know if that was a Dana item or really it was a, Maybe a, a Garuda, Garuda item. item. It said Garuda on the tent, actually. It says it on the tent. So that yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so that's, a, that's one of the Garuda items. So that, that just came with a company, you know, when, when they bought Garuda. But I've had these two tents for 20 years. They've worked through all the trips. And when those, when like this breaks, I replace it with something else and that get that makes it like five trips and gets broken. So well, I would love to have more of these tents. It, it, unless you're going to make 300, 100 of them, it's a little challenging to, <laughs> to get the economies of scale that allow you to build them efficiently and cost effectively. But, um, you know, you well, never know. When I make things here in Hood River, I have this person so things in Hood River for me to make, and make things. I make like five and sell them for some ridiculous price. Oh, okay. And the people that really need them, they're very happy. Like we'll pay the whatever ridiculous price because we really need this item. It's, I'm not making 300. No, I don't think there's even a need for 300. Okay. But I was hoping to duplicate the tents and then find some more of these poles so I can put it all together. Yeah, ten pole technologies is going to be your best bet for that. Sweet, that's super helpful. So, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Mike Mike Martell at Pacific River Supply. He makes a lot of groovers. Huh. Yeah, yeah, you're saying there's not that big a market. He he built he built a shit pile of groovers. Oh, there's a market for groovers, but there's not a massive market for groover tents. 
Uh, yeah, that's true. Because private boaters probably don't use Gruber tents. But as right. outfitters, we like to have them uh, for, you know, to ha- if, if we can't find a private place, we'll throw a tent around it. Whereas private boaters are like, eh, they will be fine. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so can I ask, can I really quickly ask you, have you done the Minum before? Yeah. Uh, in, in Oregon? Yeah. Yeah. I want to do the Minum and the, how do you pronounce it? Wallawa or Wallawa? Yeah. The Wallawa. I, I didn't hear. The Wallawa. The Wallawa. Yeah. Um, I want to do that this year. You should. Um, and the, they, you run them. They both go into the Grand Ronde. Right. So you. I've done do that. The other. Do you want to go up in the wilderness and do the, yeah. do the mining? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. up by the lodge. Go up yeah. like, find the lodge and go so, down. So I should probably contact you outside of this uh, forum here yeah. or whatever this, this thing and ask you, um, you know, who'd you recommend to fly in there or yeah. pack, pack the gear in? Yeah. But I, I'd like to do that. Yeah. It's, yeah. So sorry about that. Just every opportunity <laughs> to gather more intel is a good thing, right? That's so interesting. Somebody from California wants to do this this eccentric run in the far northeast of Oregon. <laughs> well, the, the 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 most eccentric run I've done is the es- Escalante or oh, Escalante, yeah. whatever you want to call it, which um, um, it was a big snow year out there, and it was running 500 CFS like all um, mm-hmm. all June or something in 2006. And that's what uh, was one of that's that's sort of one of the most out there, uh, rare uh, trips yeah. that you can do, just because there's never any water. But anyway, um, take care. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've gone for a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>